Well, it's that time of year again. And as you can see, I'm fasting. Islam style. When most people think of fasting, they think of not eating. They think of abstaining from food. But in Islam, aka opposite world, fasting means gorging yourself with food multiple times per day. I guess you could say that Muhammad's followers are abstaining, in a weird sense, during Ramadan. They're abstaining from not gorging themselves with endless piles of delicious food. Islamic fasting is what we would ordinarily call feasting. For comparison, the closest thing non-Muslims have to Ramadan in the U.S. is Thanksgiving dinner. That's our big meal of the year. But Ramadan goes on for a month, and they have two gigantic meals per day. Imagine having two Thanksgiving dinners per day, every day, for an entire month. Pretty gross, right? Pure gluttony. Now imagine having two Thanksgiving dinners per day, every day, for an entire month, and calling it fasting. Imagine gorging yourself with food until you almost pass out multiple times per day, over and over again, day after day, while you announce to the world, see how devout I am? I'm fasting. Strange use of the word fasting, isn't it? All right, now what? Ooh. Gordita. Ramadan fasting is what we might call trans fasting. It's feasting that identifies as fasting. As such, our Muslim friends are to be accorded all the rights and privileges of the LGBTQ community, which means that the rest of us have to agree with them that shoveling giant plates of food into their mouths is, indeed, fasting. Ah, milk. See how easy it is to call something by a completely different name from what it actually is? If you're new to the feast, excuse me, the fast of Ramadan, hope I don't get canceled for that slip. If you're new to the fast of Ramadan, here's a brief introduction. Ramadan fattening, pardon, fasting, is one of the five pillars of Islam, the most essential practices of the religion. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. Muslims who aren't exempt for some reason are required to abstain from food, beverages, and sexual intercourse from dawn to sunset for the entire month. But once the sun goes down, it's party time. How this works in practice is quite telling. In practice, many Muslims simply reverse their day-night sleeping schedule. They sleep during the day, and stay up eating all night, with special emphasis on two huge meals, one after sunset and one before sunrise. So, in practice, Muslims who are fasting get together and gorge themselves with food at night, then gorge themselves with food early in the morning, then sleep all day. They wake up in the evening after a long day of sleeping and gorge themselves with food again. Then they snack all night and gorge themselves again early in the morning and again sleep all day. They repeat this cycle for an entire month. One of the main reasons I think it's utterly ridiculous to call this month-long cycle of binge eating and sleeping fasting is that my ordinary everyday schedule would almost qualify as Islamic fasting, minus the binge eating and the endless terrorist attacks we call the Ramadan Bamathon. As many of you know, I have five sons. Two of them have been on life support their entire lives. They have a rare genetic muscle disease. We can't leave them alone. Some years we have a night nurse, but we don't now. So I stay up with them all night, every night. I sleep during the day. My last meal before I go to sleep is around 5 a.m. So, I'm done eating before sunrise. I go to sleep around 7 or 8 in the morning. I wake up around 3 or 4 in the afternoon. 
My first meal of the day is around five or six o'clock in the evening. True, that's a little before sundown right now, but it would be very, very easy for me to shift my schedule slightly so that I only eat breakfast after sundown. Now, if I were to shift my schedule slightly, eating my first meal after sundown and eating my last meal before sunrise, can anyone say with a straight face that I would be fasting? According to Islam, I'm almost fasting all year long. Should I go around bragging about what a devout religious person I am because of all the fasting I do? Do you have any idea how insane that sounds? Think about it. Lots of people around the world and lots of people down through history eat their last meal of the day around 6 or 7 p.m. They eat breakfast around 6 or 7 a.m. Would anyone say that all these people are fasting because they go 12 hours without eating? Of course not. Well, what if they suddenly get night jobs and reverse their schedules? Is it fasting then? According to Islam, yes, it's fasting. Wow, that is a delicious chicken sandwich. Ah! It's Chick-fil-A, it's a Christian chicken sandwich. On behalf of cultural critics everywhere, I would like to issue this heartfelt apology to the trans-fasting community for hurting their religious feelings by devouring a delicious Christian chicken sandwich during the month of Ramadan. Sorry, Ramadan. I gotta have some of these waffle fries, though. I call them fasting fries. If I got paid for product placement, I could buy Twitter from Elon. This is bad. I'm stuffed. How do I keep this up for an entire month? I need to go purge. All right, I'm back and ready for ram it down round two. According to scholars, Ramadan is Arabic for eating disorder. Vimto is now like the official drink of Ramadan. It's pure sugar. I think Vimto is the Arabic word for diabetes. Tastes like carbonated cherry pancake syrup. You may be wondering, David, why do you care about this trans fasting? If people who are gorging themselves with food want to identify as fasting, who are you to judge? Well, there are two main reasons I'm talking about this. One, Ramadan is destroying Muslims physically. And two, Ramadan is destroying Muslims spiritually. First, the physical. We don't need a prophet to tell us that filling your belly with horribly unhealthy food multiple times per day for an entire month every year is bad for you. There's a sharp rise in hospital visits during Ramadan, many of them due to digestive problems. There's a surge in uncontrolled diabetes cases because of Ramadan. Thanks to Ramadan, obesity is on the rise in Muslim countries. Gulf countries are now among the fattest countries in the world. But as long as they don't eat pork, it's all halal, am I right? Food retailers have to start stocking up at least a month before Ramadan in order to keep up with the increase in food sales. Food bills increase by 50 to 100% during the month of fasting. And depending on the area, food bills can increase much more. Medical journals still find this confusing. They say things like, Surprisingly, weight gain and not weight loss was reported after Ramadan by Saudis, which indicates timely needed lifestyle and dietary modification programs for a population which reports one of the highest prevalence rates of diabetes. Yes, shocker. A month of binge eating every year leads to health problems. There are tons of studies reporting these kinds of issues, and when you point out what Ramadan is doing to the Muslim community, Muslims reply, but we don't all do that. Okay, there may be exceptions, but the statistics show this is a massive problem everywhere Islam goes. But it gets worse. Keep in mind that not everyone who's trans-fasting can sleep all day. 
Some people have to go to work during the day after partying all night, but then they can't even have a sip of water while they're working, leading to a range of medical emergencies, heat stress, traffic accidents, and so on. But as long as they don't drink a beer, it's all halal, am I right? Productivity drops between 35 and 50% during Ramadan. Imagine being less productive while giving yourself diabetes and going into debt to pay for all the food you're shoving down your gullet. What a religion. Islam? More like morbidly obese Islam. So, Ramadan causes lots of health problems for trans fasting Muslims, but that's just the physical. There's also the spiritual. Muslims claim that they follow Jesus. They say, we follow Jesus more than you Christians. Now, what they really mean when they say this is that they follow what Muhammad said about Jesus. They claim to follow all the prophets, but they're just following what one false prophet said about all the prophets. So at the end of the day, they're still following one false prophet and no one else. They definitely don't follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the all-time king of exposing religious hypocrisy. In Matthew 6, Jesus condemns religious practices that are meant to impress other people, acts of righteousness that are just for show. He talks about giving to charity and prayer, and then he says this about fasting. Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Notice, Jesus condemns fasting that's meant to be seen by others. If you're fasting in order to earn a reputation for righteousness, your reputation is the only reward you get, according to Jesus. Apart from that reward, your fasting is worthless. Imagine a religion that demands, as one of its five pillars of orthodox practice, an entire month of public fasting. It's not fasting in private. It's not fasting in secret. It's fasting that everyone sees and knows about and talks about. You're praised if you do it and blamed if you don't you literally announce to the entire world that you're fasting. That would be bad enough. But imagine what Jesus would think of this public fasting if it weren't even fasting. Imagine the level of contempt Jesus would have for a religious practice of public fasting that isn't even fasting. In other words, Imagine a religion that encourages people to pretend to fast and to praise each other for fasting, even though they're actually gorging themselves with food multiple times per day. Jesus criticized people who were actually fasting, but who wanted other people to know that they were fasting. He called them hypocrites, even though they were fasting. How much worse is it to want other people to think that you're fasting when you definitely aren't. It's a double hypocrisy. Hypocrisy for not actually fasting and hypocrisy for wanting a reputation as someone who fasts. If you made a list of everything Jesus said not to do as part of your religion and you rolled it all up into a giant ball, you'd get Islam. The main question that remains is, why is Islam like this? Why do Muslims eat more and spend more and waste more when they're fasting than when they're not fasting? Why put a mask of piety on extreme gluttony? The answer, I think, lies at the very heart of Islam. Islam doesn't teach people to control their desires. Islam encourages people, the men especially, to carry their desires to perverse extremes but it only allows them to satisfy these desires within an Islamic framework, thus trapping people with their own desires and using these desires in the service of the religion. For instance, if a non-Muslim man goes clubbing regularly and has sex with a hundred different women, 
Islam will condemn him as a fornicator. But if this same man converts to Islam and joins the jihad movement, he can marry four women and take home sex slaves after every battle and be perfectly righteous before Allah, even if he has sex with a hundred different women. Notice, same desire in both cases, sex with lots of women. But one is acceptable and the other is unacceptable, based on whether it's advantageous to Islam. Likewise, if a psychopath goes on a killing spree, he's surely going to hell, according to Islam. Unless, of course, he goes on a killing spree as a terrorist attack for the sake of Allah as part of the Ramadan bombathon, in which case his violent massacre will earn him a one-way ticket to paradise where he'll spend eternity deflowering virgins. The psychopath wants to kill either way, but Islam provides the framework for pleasing Allah while satisfying the desire. According to Muslim sources, the tribes of Mecca were violent, lascivious, and gluttonous. Muhammad didn't change their behavior when he forced them to convert to Islam. He made their desires even more extreme and presented them with only one way to satisfy them. The Islamic way. When you can take the lowest, most animalistic part of people and convince them that it's the best part of them and that they're serving God by killing and raping and shoveling food in their faces, you've just made yourself an army. Hence, the rapid spread of Islam. Should we be surprised that Ramadan is a month-long series of gluttonous feasts that Muslims call fasting and view as one of their highest religious duties? Not at all. When Muhammad is your prophet, you don't have someone who can give sight to the blind or raise the dead. You only get one miracle. What's the one miracle in Islam? It's this. Islam takes behavior that's normally regarded as selfish and harmful and miraculously transforms it into the will of God. You're not. You're not. You're not.